Greetings, folks, and welcome to An Eclectic Humanist. Today, I think I'd like to change directions a bit from what we were doing the last few episodes and jump back to the early modern period, specifically early modern feminism, and more specifically still, one of the best early modern thinkers that you've almost certainly never heard of. I think at a time when women's authority over their own bodies is once again under attack, and under attack from primarily religious authority, wearing the garb of politics, it might be worthwhile to dive back into a period about 200 years before the beginning of what we generally consider to be first wave feminism, and the work of a thinker who seems to preempt by almost two centuries many of the arguments used by, for example, Mary Wollstonecraft in her Vindication of the Rights of Women. Her name is Jane Anger, and in 1589 she published a single short pamphlet, an essay, succinctly titled Her Protection for Women to Defend Them Against the Scandalous Reports of a Late Surfeiting Lover and All Other Like Venerians That Complain So to Be Overcloyed with Women's Kindness. Written by Jane Anger, Gentlewoman. What I think I'll do to start out is not to go into too much detail with the pamphlet itself, though I will be pursuing a few lines of thought there, but rather to discuss the context into which Jane Anger's writing, without which I think there's really no way to understand what she's actually up to. In order to do that, I will have to look fairly bluntly at medieval and early modern notions on women that any modern reader cannot help but see as misogynistic, or at least that any intellectually honest modern reader cannot help but see as misogynistic. In doing so, I will have to look at some of the ways in which the religious discourse of the time was deployed against the interests of women, quite explicitly so. And in doing that, I just want to be very clear here that I'm not attacking anyone's religion. I'm looking at the institutional and historic deployment of particular texts not at any truth claims or beliefs that may underlie the writings of those texts or that may be important to anyone who adheres to them. Or in other words, I just need to be very clear that a criticism of an institution is not the same as a criticism of a religion. And with all of that being said, what say we get on with things? The first thing we should probably do is just take a look at the status of women in Catholic Europe prior to the Protestant Reformation, and then go from there. Because, of course, there's a long history lying behind what Jane Anger is doing here, and I want to encapsulate as much of that as I possibly can in this brief discussion. So what I should probably do is go back fairly far toward the beginning and point out that after the conversion, the status of women in Northern Europe took a serious nosedive. The social values or mores emanating up from Rome and the Mediterranean generally were far more strictly patriarchal, far more regimented than the mores of the displaced worldviews. Women were, with a few very rare exceptions, shut out of public affairs and tended even in noble families to remain uneducated, again with some notable exceptions, but I'm speaking here of general patterns. Women could not inherit or hold property, and when universities became a thing, were unable to attend them. There was also a very large body of discourse condemning women, attacking women in pretty much every way imaginable, and this discourse emanated from the highest authority. I'll give you a few examples, again, not to throw stones, but to illustrate the intellectual culture against which Jane Anger is responding. Unless you know what she's responding to, you have no idea what she's actually doing. But this little gem by Tertullian, an early church father, will probably help you understand. According to Tertullian, woman is, and I quote, a temple built over a sewer, a gateway to the devil. Woman, you are the devil's doorway. You led astray one whom the devil would not dare attack directly. It was your fault that the Son of God had to die. You should always go in mourning and rags. And Tertullian wasn't the only one to view women in such a negative light. Here we have Augustine. Woman was merely man's helpmate, a function which pertains to her alone. She is not the image of God. 
but as far as man is concerned, he is by himself the image of God. That is, for Augustine, the image of God is a masculine image, and it does not extend into women. Augustine, of course, here is appealing to the creation story in which God fashions Adam out of dust and then Eve from one of Adam's ribs, and this is something to which we'll return when we get to Jane Anger herself because she addresses it. But as long as we're on the topic of Augustine, here's another little gem of his. What is the difference whether it is a wife or a mother? It is still Eve the temptress that we must be aware of in any woman. I fail to see what use woman can be to man if one excludes the function of bearing children. I could go on at great length, but for the sake of brevity, I won't. Instead, I think I'll take a look at a little bit of scripture that was often also deployed against women's interests. And this as well is something that Jane Anger addresses herself, so it's quite topical to the work that we're looking at. Eve, for example, typically bears most of the blame, as we saw with Augustine and Tertullian, for that whole apple kerfuffle in the garden. And numerous examples in the literature of the time drew upon biblical women, for example, Delilah and her betrayal of Samson, to illustrate the perfidious nature of women. Now, that being said, other examples were also drawn to defend women, so I'm not trying to assert that the Bible is an unambiguously anti-feminist document. What I'm concerned with, as I said, is the deployment of the text. For example, the oft-cited passage in Ephesians 5.22, Wives, be subject to your husbands as you are to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ is the head of the church, the body of which is the Savior. Just as the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be in everything to their husbands. Or, if you prefer, there's always 1 Corinthians 14, verses 33 to 35. As in all the churches of the saints, women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but should be subordinate. As the law also says, if there is anything they desire to know, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is shameful for a woman to speak in church. Or, if you prefer 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15, let a woman learn in silence with full submission. I permit no woman to teach or have authority over a man. She is to keep silent, for Adam was formed first, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman was deceived, and became the transgressor. Yet she will be saved through childbearing, provided they continue in faith and love and holiness with modesty. And again, on that whole order of creation thing, we'll get to that when Jane Anger does. In the meantime, if you want to look more at the inferior status of women in the New Testament, and here we look particularly at Paul, there's always 1 Corinthians 11, which I won't read at length, but that demands that women go veiled, that is, with their heads covered, as an indication of their inferior status to men. And I bring up some of these passages because if you spend time, as I do, lurking in places where fundamentalists and anti-feminists do their thing online, you still find these passages being referred to as justifications for women holding an inferior status to men in modern society. So this is by no means a dead issue. That said, we are not currently talking about Catholic medieval Europe. We're talking about early modern Europe and particularly the Protestant part of it. And the status of women did change to a degree after the Protestant Reformation but not to a degree that we might perhaps wish had happened. For example, it became far more common for women to be educated in the home in Protestant families than in Catholic families for the simple reason of direct engagement with biblical text being seen as central in Protestant theology to one's salvation. So parents who could teach their children to read would often teach both their sons and their daughters to read because they wanted their daughters to be able to engage the Bible as well. That is, education became a matter of religious salvation, and in the best cases this consideration extended to daughters as well as to sons. On the other hand, Martin Luther himself was kind of a misogynist, actually kind of a bastard. He writes, for example, if women become tired or even die, that does not matter. Let them die in childbirth that's why they are there. Or, there's always this little gem, the word and works of God is quite clear that women were made either to be wives or prostitutes. Or, if you prefer, God created Adam master and lord of living creatures, but Eve spoilt all when she persuaded him to set himself above God's will 
Tis you women with your tricks and artifices that lead men into error. Or I'll just give you one more. Men have broad and large chests and small narrow hips, and more understanding than women who have but small narrow breasts and broad hips, to the end that they should remain at home, sit still, keep house, and bear and bring up children. So there was no time in early modern Europe where there was anything resembling equality for women. That said, generally speaking, women were better off in Protestant countries than they were in Catholic ones, and generally speaking as well, better off in England than elsewhere, partly probably because England had a very successful queen during the Elizabethan period who managed to control the realm on her own authority and by her own wits, belying the notion that women were not capable of engaging in public affairs. That said, even in Elizabethan England, which is the period we're looking at for Jane Anger, women were under very strict control. They could not vote. Girls and unmarried women were under the legal authority of their father, or if their father was dead, their nearest male relative, sometimes even a younger brother. Married women were under the authority of their husband. This, by the way, is why Queen Elizabeth never married. A widowed woman had a relative degree of freedom as long as she didn't remarry because she had passed from the authority of her father to the authority of her husband who had died and there was no man left to have authority over her unless she did remarry. Women, of course, could not attend university in England. In fact, were not allowed to attend university in England until, I believe, the early 20th century or possibly later 19th. And even if educated privately, there were certain fields that were effectively closed to women. Biblical translation, biblical interpretation or theology, for example, and any of the professions requiring an education, as well as publishing books with some interesting exceptions. Pregnant women were allowed to publish books. And the genre to which they were generally confined was parental advice books. Now, during the Elizabethan period, roughly 800 first editions were printed by pregnant women writing parental advice books. And the rationale here is that because mortality in childbirth was so common that it was entirely possible that a woman's only contribution to her child's upbringing would be her published work because there was a very strong possibility she wouldn't be there herself. So the publishing of parental advice books became sort of a... um almost a surrogate parenthood. Now, I've read several of these books, and many of them are politically quite savvy, using the guise of parental advice to make arguments for the equality of education of men and women, for example, or rather of boys and girls. That is, there was an awareness of and a rebellion against the strictly enforced gender inequality of the period. I'll return to that in a moment. In the meantime, regarding the legal status of women in Elizabethan England. They could be beaten by their husbands so long as the public peace was not disturbed. That is, the well-being of the woman was not at issue. What was at issue was disturbing the neighbors. And a woman could not sue for divorce. If a husband sued for divorce, which he could do, he retained custody of the children. And the husband has sexual rights to the wife's body. These rights are not reciprocated. That is, the wife does not have sexual rights to the husband's body. And marital rape is not recognized in England as a thing until sometime in the late 20th century. I can't recall the exact year off the top of my head. But getting back to the discourse on the nature of women, perhaps I should mention that this discourse has a name. It's called the Querelle des Femmes, the argument about women. And it dates back to the Middle Ages. And in fact, since the advent of the printing press at the end of the Middle Ages, it was, when we're looking at short publications, pamphlets such as Jane Anger's, the second most widely publicized debate or topic of discourse in England after the polemic debate between Catholics and Protestants. That is, it was an integral part of the print culture of the time. That said, it's a debate that up until 1589 appears to have been conducted by men and for men, largely as a rhetorical exercise, even a playful exercise, where men would sharpen their rhetorical skills so that they could practice them on more serious matters. There are even multiple cases of men publishing pamphlets on one side and then on the other side, simply, as I said, practicing their rhetorical skills, honing their wits, and exercising their intellects. Jane Anger, in 1589, 
appears to be the first woman to weigh in in the Carrel de Femme in print, and this is one of the reasons why I've chosen to focus on her. Now, it's entirely possible that Jane Anger is a pen name. People wrote under pen names all the time. So there is a great deal of uncertainty about her identity. But while, um, while her name obviously could be a pen name, and she even addresses early in the pamphlet the anger with which she writes, there were actually five Jane Angers living in England at the time. Unfortunately, no other surviving published works or references to other surviving published works remain. So whoever wrote this, whichever of the Jane Angers it may have been, the document is pretty much a standalone, and it's responding to a pamphlet that is explicitly anti-feminist in its argument, but unfortunately, the pamphlet to which she is responding also doesn't survive. That said, I should maybe say a little bit about the text itself, maybe give you an indication of how you might approach it, and then discuss maybe one or two of the questions that Jane Anger addresses. One question to bear in mind, of course, is who is the intended audience and why? That is, to whom is it actually addressed? And what's the rhetorical purpose of the particular mode of address that she uses? I'll get back to that in a moment. You might also want to consider that for a short piece, this is really an intellectual and scholarly tour de force. And it's a tour de force in fields in which, at the time, women were not supposed to participate. She engages in biblical interpretation and classical scholarship. She also has many different modes in which she argues. She argues by anecdote, she argues by evidence-based reasoning, she argues by deductive argument, and she employs a great deal of both irony and sarcasm. So rhetorically as well, it's, it's quite a goldmine actually. What you'll want to ask yourself is why she is showcasing her intellect so much, why she's showcasing her learning, and why she's writing in a style that is explicitly modeled on the Latin scholarly prose that was a prestige discourse in learned society. You'll see what I mean when we jump into the text, because of course there's really not much point in talking to you about her if we don't take a look at at least some of what she actually does. And honestly, she's a lot of fun. So for the textual part of this little talk, what I think I'd like to do is just look at the two introductory letters and get a sense of how she's setting the document up, what sort of rhetorical strategy she's employing, what clues she's dropping as to how the thing should be read, and then go on to talk about one particular line of thought that I think she follows through in a really interesting way. I hope this is enough to intrigue your interest and to perhaps prompt you to track down a copy of the pamphlet, which is freely available online. The University of Pennsylvania has a digital edition available. As for the two letters or introductory notes, I think I'll just read those both now so they're right at the front of your minds and then address them both together. So the first one goes something like this. It's addressed to the gentlewomen of England, health. Gentlewomen, though it is to be feared that your settled wits will advisedly condemn it, which my choleric vein hath rashly set down, and so perchance anger shall reap anger for not agreeing with diseased persons. Yet, if with indifferency of censure you consider the head of the quarrel, I hope you will rather show yourselves defendants of the defender's title than complainants in the plaintiff's wrong. I doubt judgment before trial, which were injurious to the law, and I confess that my rashness deserveth no less, which was a fit of my extremity. I will not urge reasons, because your wits are sharp and will soon conceive my meaning. Nay will I be tedious, lest I prove too, too troublesome, nor over-darken my writing, for fear of the name of a riddler. But, in a word, for my presumption I crave pardon, because it was anger that did write it, committing your protection and myself to the protection of yourselves, and the judgment of the case to the censures of your just minds. And then we move to the second introductory note, addressed to all women in general, and gentle reader whatsoever. Fie on the falsehood of men whose minds go off to matting and whose tongues cannot so soon be wagging, but straight they fall a-tattling. Was there ever any so abused, so slandered, so railed upon, so wickedly handled undeservedly as are we women? Will the gods permit it 
the goddesses stay their punishing judgments, and we ourselves not pursue their undoings for such devilish practices, St. Paul's steeple and Charing Cross, a halter hold all such persons. Let the streams of the channels in London streets run so swiftly as they may be able alone to carry them from that sanctuary. Let the stones be as ice, the soles of their shoes as glass, the ways steep like Etna, and every blast a whirlwind, puffed out of Boreas his long throat, that these may hasten their passage to the devil's haven. Shall surfeiters rail on our kindness? You stand still and say not, and shall not anger stretch the veins of her brains, the strings of her fingers, and the lists of her modesty to answer their surfeiting? Yes, truly. And herein I conjure all of you to aid and assist me in defense of my willingness, which shall make me rest at your commands. Fare you well. Your friend, Jane Anger. And aren't these just wonderful and each very, very different? One thing I'd like to draw your attention to is her addresses themselves. The first one to the gentlewomen of England and the second one to all women in general and the gentle reader whatsoever. I bring this up because both address the text to women primarily, the first one exclusively, which is against the norm in the discourse of the time. Of course, most, most writing at the time was done by and addressed to men. But notice also the progression from the gentlewomen of England to all women in general and the gentle reader whatsoever, basically all women and whatever men are not assholes. What this does from the outset, and this is a strategy she continues with throughout the text, is puts men in the position to which women are accustomed to being put. That is, as the objects of discourse, not as participants in it, as being rhetorically excluded from the conversation. The text is posited, in other words, primarily as a conversation among women. This doesn't mean, of course, that only women will read it, but what it does mean is that men reading it are going to be rhetorically placed in a position to which their discourse customarily confines women. So there's a taste here right from the beginning of basically, see, how do you like it? But now let's give some thought to the first introductory note and the theme that she adopts there. She adopts a theme of being on trial, the motif rather of being on trial or of a legal proceeding. This also is a choice that's deeply rooted in the cultural discourse of gender. Women, of course, being excluded from the practice of law. But she also introduces a really interesting idea. She says she doubts judgment before trial. So that is, until a trial is made, there can be no valid judgment. What this suggests, and the suggestion is followed through, is that for the case that she'll be making, she will be presenting evidence. And she does this in some interesting ways. She does go on to present, as I mentioned in the introductory part of this talk, empirical evidence, arguments from various textual authorities, both scriptural and other mythological, anecdotes, syllogisms, and a few others that escape my mind at the moment. So she's presenting herself basically as a defending attorney representing herself and who is defending herself against what turns out to be a slander. Now, unfortunately, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, the charge against which she's defending herself, the pamphlet to which she's responding, no longer exists. But fortunately, she does seem to sum up enough of its contents that we get a fairly good idea of what it says by reading her document. And anybody curious enough to pursue this any further will have no trouble finding other similar anti-feminist documents that at least fit the bill of the type of thing to which she'd be responding. I bring this up because while this as a standalone document may look like she is being particularly aggressive and hostile toward men, she is just responding to the way men have spoken about women historically since time immemorial and the way that they were speaking about women in her culture at that time. And of course, while we could invoke that old namby-pamby excuse, well, you can't judge another culture by the standards of yours. Well, you know, fuck that. Because her brain is the same as your brain. 
and her brain is capable of reaching the same conclusions your brain is capable of reaching, and the conclusions that her brain reached were that late medieval and early modern anti-feminism were bullshit. And actually, it's on the topic of shit that I would like to move on to the second introductory note. You probably noticed that the tone in the second note is much less formal than the tone in the first one. She's no longer adopting the legal motif here, but is addressing a more general readership quite explicitly. And you can tell this again from the header. One thing I'd like to refer to here is her reference to the washing away of the purveyors of misogynistic discourse through the streams and channels in the London streets. This reference may be lost on a modern or a late modern rather readership because we're all accustomed to our sewers being under the streets. In London in the 16th century, they weren't. That is, the gutters of the streets of London literally ran with shit. That's where it went. They were open sewers. So, when a moment ago I referred to anti-feminist discourse using a fecal image, I didn't make that up. That's her. And on this note of excrement, I think it's time that we move on to the particular approach that Jane Anger takes to theology. Because, of course, as some of the comments that I read to you in the introductory bit indicate, and as a wealth of others that you could find will support, many of the arguments against women, that is, many of the misogynistic arguments coming out of the Corral de Femme, had their roots in theological discourse, in the interpretation of Scripture. Her attack on theology as a legitimate means of evaluating the nature of women, or quite frankly, I think of anything, is twofold, and is never actually stated as such, for what are probably obvious reasons given the period in which she's living. But let's take a look at the first prong of her attack. And here is where she addresses the order of creation to which I've referred a few times and promised that I would get to. Now, you'll recall the argument that Adam was made first by God's hand and that Eve was made simply from a part of Adam being used as an argument for the inferiority of women, particularly as Genesis does say quite clearly that Eve is to be Adam's helpmate. This line of reasoning is not, of course, the only re line of reasoning one can take with this text, but historically it actually has been the dominant one. Here, though, we see Jane Anger taking a slightly different approach, and one that I absolutely love. So, we'll pick it up in media res, and I'll just read to you a little bit. Now, while this greedy grazer is about his entreaty of love, which nothing belongeth to our matter, let us secretly ourselves with ourselves Consider how and in what they that are our worst enemies are both inferior unto us and most beholden unto our kindness. I'm going to pause here because she's doing something really interesting. She's rhetorically saying, okay, well, well, this guy is about his business. We women are just going to talk amongst ourselves. So again, drawing attention to or flagging the exclusion based on gender to which women historically in Western society, and not only in Western society, have been subjected, but reversing it and putting men in that excluded position. But then she goes on. The creation of man and woman at the first, he being formed in principio of dross and filthy clay, did so remain until God saw that in him his workmanship was good, and therefore by transformation of the dust which was loathsome unto flesh it became purified. Then, lacking a help for him, God making woman of man's flesh, that she might be purer than he, doth evidently show how far we women are more excellent than men. Our bodies are fruitful, whereby the world increaseth, and our care wonderful by which man is preserved. From woman sprang man's salvation, a woman was the first that believed, and a woman likewise the first that repented of sin. Okay, so there's a couple of things going on here. One, part of her interpretation is actually fairly standard, and completely true to Scripture. That is, that salvation entered the world through Mary, a woman, kind of hard to get around, and that a woman, Mary Magdalene, was the first to believe, also has scriptural authority. 
So she is, on the one hand, working within a context of accepted interpretation. On the other, the really interesting stuff is what she does with Adam. And rather than having the standard interpretation of Eve being Adam's inferior because she was made from his rib and he directly from earth or dirt by the hand of God, treats Adam as the filtration device through which God's work is purified and perfected in Eve. This is beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. I've always loved it. And what she's doing is something that women aren't supposed to do. Women at the time, as I mentioned, are not supposed to even engage in scriptural interpretation. And yet here she is showing awareness of some standard interpretations. That is kind of putting her resume on the table saying, I know what I'm talking about. And then turning other standard interpretations completely on their head, but working within a logic that you can get out of the text. Now, the way in which, which you can coax logic out of the text, she has a term for that, and I think that's the term I want to address next. She uses the term glows or glozing. Now, glozing in English, at least, has an interesting history. To gloze, it's related to our word to gloss, to provide a commentary, to provide an interpretation. So, what she is doing with her scriptural interpretation is she is glozing the text. Now, since Chaucer, glozing has some interesting meanings and I want to address those next before going on to the other prong of her approach to theology, particularly where women are concerned. But as I said, glozing. If you want to go back to Chaucer's time just briefly, and Chaucer died in 1400, just to give you a reference point, in the Canterbury Tales, the term glows comes up a fair bit, and it's in its conventional term of interpret, or provide an interpretation, or give an informed commentary, until you get to the Wife of Bath's tale. And the Wife of Bath refers to, well, she has a number of husbands, but um, her fifth one, I believe it's her fifth, Nicholas, she refers to Nicholas as being able to glows her, in ways that revealed some very satisfying interpretations. So, since Chaucer, at least, there's been a subtext to the term glozing, which kind of means fucking. And this meaning is certainly present in Jane Anger's text, where the term comes up twice in fairly close succession. And it's not a word in everyday usage, and the fact that it comes up twice on the same page means she has something in mind with it. She says, for example, the smooth speeches of men are nothing unlike the vanishing clouds of the air, which glide by degrees from place to place, till they have filled themselves with rain. When breaking, they spit forth terrible showers, so men glows till they have their answers, which are the end of their travail. Or, to take a look a little later on on the same page, she has the following to say. Their fawning is flattery, their faith falsehood, their fair words allurements to destruction, and their large promises tokens of death, or of evils worse than death. Their singing is a bait to catch us, and their playings plagues to torment us. And therefore take heed of them, and take this as an axiom in logic and a maxim in the law, nola fides hominibus, there is no truth in men. There are three accidents to men, which of all are most unseparable, lust, deceit, and malice. Their glozing tongues, the preface to the execution of their vile minds, and their pens, the bloody executioners of their barbarous manners. So, in both these cases here, what we see is the term glows, referring to a sort of a dishonest interpretation, a way of coaxing a meaning out of a text or a person, that isn't actually there, that is making it say what you want it to say, rather than what it actually says. The polite academic term for that kind of text fuckery, by the way, is hermeneutics. And Jane Anger's usage here, when she's in the midst of interpreting various texts to a preconceived notion of what she wants them to mean, is a really good example of how glozing works. That is, it's not based on finding the truth in the text, but rather on making the text agree with a pre-decided or preferred reading. 
And insofar as a text is capable of being glozed in that particular way, it's of course also not that reliable as a guide to truth, is it? There's a way out of the bind, and Jane Anger herself offers a way out, which I'll get to in a few minutes. But first we have to finish addressing the bind itself as she approaches it. A little while after the creation passage that we were discussing a minute ago, she goes on to say, And now, seeing as I speak to none but you which are of my own sex, give me leave, like a scholar, to prove our wisdom more excellent than theirs, though I never knew what sophistry meant. There is no wisdom, but it comes by grace. This is a principle, and contra principiu non est disputander. Against principle there is no argument. But grace was first given to a woman because to Our Lady, which premises conclude that women are wise. Now, primu est optimu, first is best, and therefore women are wiser than men. So, okay, what's she doing here? This is, I think, another little brilliant bit. To start, she's identifying herself once again as just a woman speaking to women. We'll leave all those silly men to do their thing. And then she identifies herself as speaking like a scholar. What she's referring to here is the scholastic philosophers. Scholasticism was the dominant school of philosophy at the time. It's based in the work of Thomas Aquinas. And it's a school of thought that tends to proceed largely through syllogistic reasoning, that is, reasoning from major and minor premises to a conclusion. When she posits first is best as a major premise, what she's saying is that this is beyond dispute, that this is what we call an axiom. Axioms are parts of an argument that you simply accept. And having established that first is best as her major premise, is an axiom, and that as a minor premise, a woman was first to receive grace, and that wisdom only comes from grace. She can therefore reason in a logically valid way. And technically, validity refers to the structure of the argument, not necessarily to its contents, toward women being superior to men. The problem with that, of course, is that it's not got a single empirical fact to back it up. And this is the difficulty with scholastic reasoning, as Jane Anger points out, and as, quite frankly, Francis Bacon will point out about 30 years later when he invents the scientific method. And for the same reasons, you can make words do anything. In the absence of empirical evidence, you can glose the fuck out of any text and make it say anything you want, which means that what you're doing is basically useless. It's mental masturbation. And she's flagging this fact by using the exact opposite argument that she used with the creation story. She's arguing here that first is best and a woman was first to receive grace, therefore women are better than men. But with the creation, she argued that Adam being created first did not in fact make him better, but made him worse because Eve was the result of Adam's working basically as a filtration device, getting rid of all of the impurities in the dirt from which he was formed. Now, none of this has any empirical basis whatsoever, so it's absolutely useless as a guide to truth. What she's doing is quite consciously highlighting the fact that arguing in the absence of evidence is worthless. And that all of these arguments coming out of the Corral de Femme about the inferiority of women are nothing but that. They're just empty words because not based in evidence. That is, to be really blunt about it, she is very subtly, I think, and brilliantly saying there is no authority in Scripture and there is no authority in scholastic philosophy to prove an empirical case, to prove an actual truth claim. So, how do we know, how do we establish that women are not inferior to men and that the misogyny of the culture in which she lived is completely baseless? Well, she does give us an answer. And her answer is a quintessentially modern answer, an answer in keeping with the scientific revolution through the early years of which she's living, and in keeping as well 
with many of the arguments that have developed since her time about the equality of, for example, women and men, and the equality of races, and the equality, in fact, of human beings in general. She says, for example, that we learn most effectively from experience, or in her words, experientia prestantior arte, experience is superior to artifice, and he that hath experience to prove his case is in better case than they that have all inexperienced bookcases to defend their titles. This is counter to the scholastic method, and this is counter to arguing from scriptural authority. In fact, it's counter to what we might consider a hierarchy of proofs or demonstration or authority for the basis of knowledge claims operating in the late medieval period and well into the early modern period, where the greatest authority was scripture and then Aristotle and then other classical philosophers and then books in general and then tradition and at the very bottom, empirical observation all of which, of course, was completely stood on its head by the scientific revolution. That is, she's not just doing what the misogynists did, but doing it back to them. She's in performing their game in front of them, but reversing it. She's showing the game itself to be flawed. She's showing their modes of reasoning to be baseless. And here, if you want to skip right to the end, because I did promise I'd only talk about a few things, she concludes with a couple of poems, and while I'm not going to read them to you, I'd like to draw your attention to the last line of the first poem. It's in Latin, vivendo disque. This is the method that Jane Anger is actually proposing to explore the relative merits or capacities of men and women. What it means, vivendo disque, learn by living, that is, learn by experience. Don't learn by authority. Don't accept authority. Don't learn by just making up axioms and then reasoning your way to whatever conclusion you want. Don't glows books. Don't glows people. But observe. Look at the evidence. As she suggests in her first introductory note, look at the evidence in the trial and base your conclusions on that. Well, fine. This all sounds nice, but I still haven't presented you with any evidence, have I? And she still hasn't presented you with any evidence, has she? Except for one thing. And this is where I think she's particularly brilliant. In using the rhetorical strategies that are so often deployed against women in book after book after book, in century after century after century, and turning those on their heads, showing them up to be baseless, she herself is the evidence. And that evidence is empirical. She's effectively saying, I am the example. Look at what I can do. Look at it honestly. And I dare you to call me inferior. So now I should probably wrap things up. This has been a longer episode than I had in mind. And there's a limit to how long I can expect anyone to sit and listen to me blabber on about some obscure writer from 400 plus years ago. But just to bring everything back around to the here and now, I do think it's useful sometimes to have a perspective from outside of our own time and place from which we can actually look at the struggles and conflicts that people in our world right now are going through. And particularly south of the border in the US, the United States has just returned to a position where the rights that one actually has over one's own body are determined by whether or not one has a uterus. That is, for the first time, I believe, in the history of the United States, the Supreme Court has actually stripped people of rights. And the movement of which this is simply the latest manifestation is based out of a particularly conservative approach to religion. It is anti-humanist. And it is, to use the term that I was discussing a few minutes ago, a particularly nasty glozing of religious text and religious authority. It is, as pointed out here and in previous episodes, intellectually dishonest, deeply dishonest. And the struggle that women are having right now in the United States is in many ways the same struggle that Jane Anger was having. How to assert one's innate equality against a religiously justified misogyny whose proponents cannot be trusted to argue in good faith. For now, though, as I said, it's probably time for me to stop talking. 
I hope after listening to this that some of you may actually track down Jane Anger's pamphlet and give it a read. It's a very rich text whose surface I've only just barely scratched in this little talk. I think any modern feminist will find in Jane Anger a genuine kindred spirit, and someone who seems to have actually been a couple of centuries ahead of her time. But of course, she's not the only person in that period who was ahead of her time, and I think next episode I'd like to lean even further into the eclectic side of eclectic humanist and look at the work of one of her precise contemporaries in Ming China, making very similar arguments from a slightly different perspective. I hope you'll come back and check that out. In the meantime, thank you very much for listening. If you want to get a hold of me, you can find me at eclectic.humanist at gmail.com, on the Eclectic Humanist Facebook page, or at EC Humanist on Twitter. If you've enjoyed this, please share it. I am always genuinely grateful for the engagement. And until next time, be safe, be informed, and be kind to each other.